for the for the um, Gulf of Guinea countries. Then uh, a couple of new clauses that I will want to introduce uh, also will be this uh, ensemble uh, diagrams for the probability maps, like this one here, uh, uh, the percentiles, the median, uh, this kind of uh, ensemble uh, diagrams to uh, complete the information for the probability maps. And a new product that we are testing now in the Canary Islands would be this uh, probability maps for visibility reduction by dust. And we hope that we will have more feedback um, at the end of the year. So we'll, we will try to also include this uh, kind of uh, product in, in, our, uh, in our website. Okay, so this is uh, the last slide. So Savis, now please uh, try to share your screen. If not, let me know and we can uh, do it for you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good day, everybody. Thanks for organizing this uh, great event and happy uh, 12 July to all the uh, great people who are working on Sand and Dust Storm. As a matter of fact, um, on the coming five minutes, I'm going to uh, just have a brief introduction of uh, uh, the research done by me and my colleagues, uh, Dr. Nushin Khodam and Dr. Mati Rahnama from Research Institute of Meteorology and Atmospheric Science of Tehran, Iran, on investigating uh, dust impact uh, on chlorophyll A concentration variation over the Persian Gulf, Oman Sea, and uh, southern of uh, Caspian Sea. As you may consider, uh, uh, you know, there is uh, environmental factors and, uh, you know, variation in light temperature, salinity and dissolved oxygen that can affect uh, the chlorophyll A concentration. And it, it could be considered as the uh, high nutrients for plankton that it also can affect water quality as well as uh, color and also the, the taste and pH of the water. On the other hand, um, the changes in physical and chemical properties of water, as well as frequent growth of toxic uh, cyanobacteria and also decrease in dissolved oxygen in the water can uh, lead to the uh, phytoplankton death. And as you may consider, the excessive increase in the uh, population of phytoplankton can have a negative uh, um, you know, consequences as well as some impacts on ecology economy as well as health. So uh, if we want to have a better uh, clarification of dust deposition in the sea, we can uh, just uh, focus on the uh, you know, impact of uh, dust as a food source, most especially on uh, from the uh, micronutrients uh, like nitrogen or phosphorus uh, or uh, micronutrients like uh, you know, Fe that can uh, play an important role in increasing the concentration of chlorophyll fields and leading to the phytoplankton growth. As a matter of fact, um, during the uh, last two years, uh, my colleagues and I just tried to investigate the impact of sand and dust storm on chlorophyll A concentration variability in the southern parts of the Caspian Sea, which is uh, near the Karakom, uh, Turkmenistan, uh, as one of the main hotspots of uh, you know, Central Asia, and also investigating the effects of uh, sea depth on chlorophyll A concentration variability in the Persian Gulf and the Amman Sea. Uh, the other um, objective actually was the finding the relationship between sea depth variation uh, in different parts of Persian Gulf and Oman Sea, and also a chlorophyll A concentration according to the water surface temperature variability. Uh, in this slide, you can have a brief overview of the study area. Um, you know, we just focused on the southern part of the Caspian Sea. And uh, let's say we used uh, the data from NASA, thanks to them. You know, uh, we used the combined dark target and deep blue AOD at uh, 550 nanometer for land and ocean, and also the sea surface temperature 
uh, on water and also, uh, you know, the chlorophyll A concentration over uh, water. Uh, on the next step, we focus on the Persian Gulf and in order to have a better clarification of the role of sea depth on the, uh, you know, the importance of uh, let's say the sea depth on the uh, chlorophyll A concentration and also their uh, impacts on, um, you know, and effectivity on the AOT and, you know, their relationship with AOT and SST. Uh, as you may consider, we chose uh, seven uh, regions. Uh, these regions, you know, the number one, two, uh, let's say three, and four, indicating the, um, uh, you know, the coastal area, which, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, th this is not deep, while the numbers of the region 5, 6, and 7 are the deep region. Uh, th th these are the results, uh, you know, that uh, just were the outputs of investigating the impacts of dust on chlorophyll A concentration variation in the southern part of the uh, Caspian Sea. As you may consider on the, uh, let's say, on the top uh, right of the uh, slide, you can see the statistically significant um, negative correlation with, uh, you know, a coefficient level of 95% um, between the concentration of uh, chlorophyll A and also uh, the AOD during the, let's say, during the period of uh, uh, more than 20 uh, years, during the years 2020, uh, uh, 2003 to 2023. And also the, the trend of SSD, you can see the increasing one while uh, except the five years, the last five years, there is no, um, you know, the last five years shows the increase in AOT, uh, which is near the Karakom uh, hotspot while, um, uh, you know, uh, during 2000, uh, three to 2019, there isn't any uh, special increasing trend uh, of AOD in this region. Uh, this is also on the on the uh, left side of the slide. You can see the correlation coefficients between chlorophyll A concentration uh, with AOD and SST. Uh, and uh, you know this is for the uh, for uh, for the whole actually a period of time period of time. While uh, on the second part, you can see for the uh, last five years that we had uh, let's say the increase in um, AOT uh, and also uh, the increase of the frequency of dust uh, over the region. In light of the uh, rise in the dust events, you know, during the whole uh, 20 years of a study, it was uh, concluded that the, the, the month August just uh, recorded the most uh, uh, frequent days of uh, having uh, sand and dust storm over the southern parts of the uh, Caspian Sea. That's why uh, we chose as one of the cases study over this uh, period. And uh, the correlation coefficients were computed between chlorophyll A concentration and AOD value. Um, uh, exactly the day uh, that the event was happened and also uh, the first and second day with the delay after the event. Uh, as you may consider, the findings indicated that a direct relationship between the chlorophyll A concentration and the AOD value immediately following a dust event uh, was uh, clearly shown, while as uh, you know, the day after and also um, you know, two days after the dust event, that was uh, there was an inverse correlation uh, between the you know increase in AOD and also uh, chlorophyll A concentration over the southern parts of the Caspian Sea. Consequently, the rise in nutrient level resulting from the uh, accumulation and also dissolvation of dust in the water led to the surge in chlorophyll concentration during the initial days. So subsequently, uh, there was a decline in oxygen levels, which in turn resulted in a decrease in chlorophyll concentration in the subsequent days. And these are, um, you know, the, um, at the bottom, you can see the uh, the whole trend, and you can see that there is an actually there is an inverse, uh, let's say, a correlation between. Sorry, Savisa, AOD and SS. Uh, can you please, uh, yeah, move okay. uh, rapidly to the conclusion okay, so sure, that everybody sure, sure. can. I will wrap it up. Thank you. Uh, these are the results for uh, the the Oman Sea and also the uh, let's say the Persian Gulf. So you can see the correlation maps between chlorophyll A concentration with SSC and AOD, most especially in the southern part. It is clear, and also um, you know this is for SSC, the A1, and B is for uh, AOD. 
if I want to wrap it up uh, very, uh, let's say, uh, very fast, uh, we can see that, uh, you know, over the uh, the, let's say over the um, um uh, the uh, Caspian Sea statistically significant negative correlation with a confidence level of ninety five percent between the concentration of chlorophyll A and the AOD during the uh, period of these twenty years uh, was seen in the southern parts of the Caspian Sea uh, while uh, you know um over the Persian Gulf and Oman see greater contribution of AOD impact on chlorophyll A variability compared to SSD in coastal area uh, actually uh, was seen uh, in regions uh, distant from the coastlines that is impacted by fluctuation in the SSD. Thank you very much. Thank you, Savis. Please, Sergio, go on if you can. And uh, just a reminder, try to yeah. keep five minutes talk uh, to everybody so we can uh, finish in time. Thank you. OK, thank you for your introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you see my slide? OK, so what I will present here is a recent study we have done on the, on the connection or association between dust deposition in the ocean and the migration and fisheries of the Atlantic skipjack tuna. As all you already know, uh, the dust deposition in the ocean is a source of new of nutrient to the special, which is especially relevant to the open part of the ocean. So the this dust deposition provides nutrient to the marine phytoplankton that stimulate the creation of new organic matter, and this organic matter is transferred across the food web from primary producers to top predators, and it has implication on fisheries. Um. What we have done is to work with the data of escapejap tuna catch in the Atlantic, in the whole Atlantic. Escapejap tuna uh, is a predator. It does not eat phytoplankton. It, uh, it a hunter. It's a predator that feeds on mollusks, squid, and the small fishes. And escapejap perform migration looking for food, looking for prey. And as you can see in, in this plot in the sea, in the pink area, uh, most of the skipjack catch in the Atlantic, almost 90%, occurs in the Eastern Atlantic and especially in the waters of Northwest Africa, uh, under the Saharan layer, I mean, uh, in waters that are uh, regularly affected by massive dust deposition. Uh, the data we have used are those official data of the International Commission for the Conservation of the Atlantic Tuna. This data have been provided by hundreds to thousands of uh, ship, uh, uh, fishing vessels that work in this area, and they provide the location and the amount of skipjack tuna they catch. This uh, skipjack tuna is a very important from the commercial point of view because it's the most abundant tuna in the Atlantic, and the, the catch accounts for almost the 50% of total tuna catch in the Atlantic. Well, skipjack tuna perform a system of migration. In winter, uh, uh, the fishing catch of skipjack tuna mainly occur in the equatorial Atlantic, as you can see in plot B1. And this is the region where most of the wet dust wet deposition occur in this region. In the spring, it starts a migration toward the north in such a way that most of the skipjack tuna occurs in the open waters of Liberia to Guinea, as you can see in the, pl um, in the plot B2. In summertime, most of the skipjack stop stock in this region are located off Mauritania and a part of it also reached the Canary Island. And in autumn, the migration start to reverse and go to the south. And as you can see during this uh, migration, most of the skipjack tuna catch occur uh, in the areas affected by massive dust deposition. Uh, because of this migration uh, in this region, the skipjack fishing, skip fishing season mainly occurs during the dust season. In the equatorial Atlantic, it mainly occurs in winter, uh, in the open waters of Liberia to Guinea in the spring with a maximum in April, May. In Senegal, the maximum is in June, uh, July, in, and in Mauritania and the Canary Island, the maximum is in uh, July, August. And this is happening because the skipjack tuna migrate from winter to summer under the Saharan layer, always in waters affected by massive dust deposition. There is also an important year-to-year -year variability. This is the example of the Canary Island. Uh, positive dust anomalies are associated with more skipjack catch, and negative dust anomalies are associated with less skipjack catch, which suggests that the 
uh, the extent of the nowhere migration is also connected to the to the influence of dust deposition and the food availability. This is also observed in other regions, as in the uh, off wa um, offshore waters of Mauritania, Senegal, and in and in other regions more close to the tropics. Uh, what I have described here is what we have called the Atlantic Sahara migration that occurs between the equatorial Atlantic and Mauritania and the Can Canary Island. We have also identified other uh, migration between Gabon and, and Angola. This migration is, uh, the amount of Escribia tuna is lower. I mean, the stock is lower because the population in this region is lower. And this migration occurs between uh, the waters of uh, Gabon where there is an important nutrient supply by a small upwelling, but especially because of the uh, discharge of the Congo River. So Congo River provides a lot of nutrient to this region. And the migration occurred to Angola, when there is an important uh, dust deposition also in the winter in, in this region. It's also important to keep an amount into account that the nutrients uh, arrive to the Usan by Sebedran path, there is a nutrient supply by the subtropical upwelling in Northwest and Southwest Africa, which mainly provide nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and uh, silicon. Also, the river discharge. And what we found in, in our studies is that uh, the dust deposition is also relevant, especially in the open ocean. So these are the conclusion that we reach. It's important to highlight that uh, the dust deposition contribute to support so plankton rich areas, optimal for feeding small fish, mollusks, and cephalops, and for fit uh, alert predators. And this has implication on fisheries. We found two dust modulated movement uh, or migration of skipjack tuna. And this has, uh, of course, huge economical implications. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio, for the very interesting findings. So we'll now move uh, to the next sec section of the webinar, which is about uh, extreme events and impacts on society. So thank you very much, Tom. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today and celebrate yes. actually the same. Sorry, Pavla, can you enlarge your screen? Yeah, present presenter mode. Yes, yes. Thank you for reminder here. Uh, so again, it's a great pleasure to celebrate here with you the second anniversary of the International Day of such important phenomena as the sand and dust storms are. And now in the second part of our webinar, which I will start with my talk, we will focus on the extreme events and impacts of sand and dust storms on societies. So, but I will take you a little bit farther from Sahara, but I will also talk about that topic and that's to the high latitudes and I will talk about the high latitude dust um, achievements and activities from the, mainly the last year. So my talk will uh, be separated in two parts. First, I will talk about the high latitude dust networks and in the second part, just very brief overview of uh, new achievements. But before I, I uh, proceed to that, I would like to actually uh, state here the f a few important key facts about the high latitude dust, what we know. So in terms of the climate um, impacts of the high latitude dust, it has been or it was recognized as an important climate driver in polar regions in, in the IPCC report on ocean and uh, cryosphere back in 2019. So high latitude dust contributes to the Arctic amplification via uh, so-called dust albedo effect uh, feedback. So the dust hotspots, which are in the Arctic, are often located very close to the glaciers. And the source of these like very fine material and dust comes from the underneath the glaciers, which are very fine sediments. So that's kind of unlimited source. And when we look at the active dust years, because not every year, of course, produce the same amount of dust in the Arctic as the other years, but during the enhanced dust activity years, the active dust sources are actually larger than 1,500,000 square kilometers. 
and the high latitude dust then contributes up to about 5% of the global dust budget. And with this area, actually, that would mean that the high latitude dust areas are slightly larger than even the second largest desert Gobi. When we come to the measurements of the high latitude dust storms, they cause severe air pollution. Sometimes we measure concentrations which are even thousand times higher than the health recommended health limits, for example, for PM10 concentrations. And as for Iceland, uh, on average, for example, in long-term analysis for more than 60 years, we see that there is about 135 dust days reported annually. And uh, that's similar to very active uh, regions of uh, dust regions of the globe. And we know that also through the satellite images and different studies that these uh, plumes from Iceland can travel thousands of kilometers inside the Arctic, but also towards the Europe. And to con uh, also to kind of conclude, the most important impacts of the high latitude dust are not only on the atmosphere and, of course, in terms of climate itself, but also on the cryosphere, marine and terrestrial environments, and it's causing severe erosion and land degradation in these fragile polar regions. And also it has impacts on socioeconomic sectors, which means health, road safety, energy production, aviation, and land degradation. So now just quickly overview over the high latitude dust networks. So when we talk about them, uh, uh, North Africa, Middle East, and Europe, note of the WMO SDS boss, we have to take in account that Iceland belongs to this node, so it doesn't really end with the long-range transport of the Saharan dust or, or Middle East dust towards Europe, but as a matter of fact, actually Iceland is the largest Euro uh, European desert. But this is just the European node or like European, African and Middle East node, but the high latitudes deserts are actually in both hemispheres and extends much farther than the location of Iceland and European Arctic. So there are two active high latitude dust networks. One is the ICEDICE, Icelandic Aerosol and Dust Association, which is a member of European Aerosol Assembly and New Arctic Thematic Network on High Latitude Dust, which are well established. And the new activities are the Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring System, National Collaboration Program for Iceland, and also NORDAS, which is funded by the Council of Ministers. So here is a screen showing activities of the Ice Dust Association. We meet annually during the High Latitude Dust Workshop, always in February in Reykjavik. And here you are welcome to join us the next year. And the association itself um, consists of 57 research institutions from 22 countries. And there are many publications which you can see uh, actually on the two websites I'm showing here. And then the Arctic uh, network on high latitude dust is very important because we also have to coordinate our activities in this Arctic region. And during the CAMS National Collaboration Program, uh, as you can see on the left map that the deserts in Iceland are not really uh, monitored with measurements uh, which are required uh, to report the uh, European air quality in different countries because these are only lo located in the cities. So in this project, we located new instruments uh, close to the deserts, which are marked here in the in the red and orange. And just for this few month measurements, we have already experienced so many uh, dust events, for example, for this southern mirror stations. And that takes me to the last part of the presentation about the new achievements. So it's always great to have a new, new network of uh, in situ measurements, especially at high latitudes. And uh, we have also measured quite remarkable concentrations, for example, in Antarctica. And there are two models which are monitoring the high latitudes. One is the DREAM model, uh, which is run by the uh, National uh, Republic uh, Weather Service of Serbia, but it's also the only high latitude dust uh, forecast uh, located at the WMO SDSS uh, WAS uh, website. So Sorry, you can see, Barbara, for example, one... today's forecast, 12th of July, it's uh, very, very dusty, especially in the Northeast Iceland. The second model is 
Ceylon, which actually covers the whole Arctic. And you can see that it's not only Iceland who is producing the dust. And the last two slides show the uh, long range transport of uh, not only high latitude dust, but also low latitude dust into the Arctic. So here is a slide showing uh, evidence which came with several papers already. Third paper was published from a small board that Icelandic dust has been um, collected there on the on the on the filters. But there are other studies that highlight uh, Icelandic dust, for example, travel to Ireland or even to Serbia. And then there are these two studies from Iceland and Finland, and this is the last slide showing that uh, because uh, Icelandic dust is of volcanic origin, we don't really have any much quartz in it, so that the giant quartz dust particles from Sahara travel over 4,000 kilometers or so towards Iceland. And uh, we have collected them there during uh, two uh, events, and on average there is almost 1.2 uh, Saharan dust even reaching Iceland. But by surprise, based on 40 years long uh, term analysis, Finland is much, uh, much better place to monitor long range transport, not only of Saharan uh, dust plumes, but also of the Kara Aral Caspian uh, dust plumes and also the dust plume from Middle East. So you can see this in our published uh, analysis uh, in the paper to the right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. We cannot hear you, Anna. I think you are muted. Okay, oh. now. Is yes. there anything? Okay, okay. Uh, my, sorry for the delay. My name is Anna Volkovich Vimic. I'm currently acting as um, chair of the NAMI node. Uh, and uh, my talk will be some situated uh, about the new problems somewhere between the dust belt and the high latitude uh, belt in uh, more concrete in southeast uh, Europe uh, uh, in Pannonian Valley, which are the lowlands of the Pannonian Basin. Uh, so um, uh, the soil uh, generated um, uh, in this region actually is a sedimentary material uh, from uh, dried out Pannonian Sea about 600 years ago, which raised uh, urgently our flags. Uh, this could be critical area for uh, uh, dust production. And, but actually it is a rich agricultural uh, production area, meaning it's a fertile soil, uh, which is assessed that can actually feed the whole Europe. But there are problems now. Uh, it has continental climate characteristics, but with a lower average precipitation, significantly lower than average for Europe, about 500 millimeters per year or even lower. And uh, because of the climate change in this region, there is increasing frequency and intensity of droughts, heat waves, and extreme precipitation, and increasing uh, weather variability, meaning that we can have shifts, rapid shifts uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, droughts uh, to the stormy weather, uh, which is uh, actually a uh, precondition for, the gener uh, for generating the local dust storms. Um, uh, and uh, because of the climate change and uh, rapid increase of temperature, the whole region uh, is increasing uh, in its level uh, in level of aridity, meaning that uh, it will have by the mid uh, uh, 21st century period problems, uh, probably with desertification because of the uh, climate change. Another problem is. Uh, poor land management, depending on the producer, but uh, in general, uh, the land management uh, is a problem. It reduced significantly some areas, uh, soil organic contact, there is intensive tillage, so disturbance of the uh, soil structure, and uh, there are unadjusted practices, uh, agricultural practices, uh, cropping practices, to weather conditions, uh, which are changing because of the climate change. 
All of this is causing increasing soil erosion in the area. So we have water erosion and wind erosion. So re related to wind erosion, uh, we have already uh, uh, evidence uh, on uh, um, uh, new uh, hazards, which are local uh, dust storms uh, um, <clears throat> made in stormy weather from agricultural fields. Uh, the first one uh, which uh, brought out the attention happened uh, in northern part of Serbia from uh, in 2017 in highway between Belgrade and uh, uh, Novi Sad. It reduced visibility to uh, zero. Then uh, in Hungary uh, last year in March, uh, there is there it causes a local dust storm caused a huge uh, crash of 42 vehicles, out of which are five trucks, 39 injured, out of which is 10 children and one dead. Uh, then there was a crash in Serbia, also in March in 2023, uh, from also from the dust storms generated from local dust, sto uh, sto uh, dust source, uh, about 14 vehicles, one truck, 10 injured. Uh, more cases happened at that time in Serbia and even this year. Uh, also, we had it last year uh, at the same time as in Hungary from local source in Slovakia, the huge crash uh, uh, in uh, in the road from Bratislava to Brno. So there are many cases uh, uh, which are not even known to the wider public because there was no notable traffic accidents and there is no official recordings of such cases from responsible institutions for red hazards, meaning the dust storms in uh, this region are not generally recognized as hazards and not including in methodologies for risk assessment, which is a huge problem. Soil erosion is increasing, especially because of the flash droughts, uh, uh, which uh, happens very rapidly because of the heat waves uh, and the most critical period uh, for uh, uh, dust storms uh, is late winter and early spring, uh, and somewhat less critical is uh, autumn after sowing. Also, we have a problem in this region with deserted lands, which are exposed to wind uh, uh, erosion and most probably degraded. Uh, this is uh, an image derived from UNCCD uh, uh, dust source uh, map. Uh, so you can see uh, the hotspots uh, of potential dust sources. Uh, they're all seasonal variable all happen only during the uh, extreme weather conditions uh, in droughts. Um, uh, and not adjusting agricultural practices uh, uh, and climate change are causing definitely the risks of the desertification land degradations and the uh, dust storms risk are increasing uh, due to climate change impacts. If we recognize this hazard, the uh, dust storms uh, in our uh, in our national policies uh, and methodologies for risk assessments, we would see that climate change impact of agricultural production, besides the impact on yield and uh, yield quality and quantity, has also additional impact, and this is impact on people's safety. Uh, road safety. Uh, so uh, this is uh, really a big potential problem. Maybe um, uh, these uh, countries could be more involved in the future in our work uh, within the SDS was, and maybe we could uh, in the future include uh, such activities in our, in our future uh, scientific implementation plan, engage a more wider community, at least from uh, uh, land degradation science. So there are also another uh, problems on the east, uh, around the Black Sea, also in Bulgaria, in Ukraine, uh, Southwest Russia, and so on. And the problems are increasing. Thank you very much and continue. Thank you, Anna. So we now move with David. On trends in the Canary Island. Uh, hello. Well, David, please, can you put in presentation mode? Yes, yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David Fares. I'm, I'm, I'm from IMET. I'm meteorologist from IMET. Um, I'm going to to briefly present our last publication titled uh, Dust, uh, Dust Event Characterization from Visi Visibility Trends and Dust Adversity Index in the Canary Island for the period 1980 uh, to 2022. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank two co-authors for their involvement in this paper. And I only have a five minutes, so if you have to read in the paper, you have any question here, you are my, my email. 
The objective of the research uh, were characterization of task intrusion using extended disability series, analyze the evolution, seasonal and yearly variation, and trends over the uh, past 42 years, assessing the dust event uh, severity, and analyzing the synoptic pattern that caused the dust event in the Canary Island from the, the study period. Um, the area of interest for the study is the Canary Island. Obviously, uh, Canary Island uh, is very important for us to, to improve our technology uh, about the diesel dust intrusion. So it's very interesting, interesting for our region. Uh, the data we use for the research comes from the six main airport in the Canary Island. In the, in the plot you can see in the map, you can see the, the, the location of these six main airports. Um, specifically, we use the visibility data measured by aeronautical observer at 13 UTC. Um, we consider the a relative humidity measure below 70%. Uh, this threshold is introduced to exclude uh, possible influence of Fort Smith's event that uh, we have to ensure that the reduction in visibility is due to dust. Um, also, we use uh, daily geopotential height anomalies data uh, for, for calculate, to calculate synoptic pattern we cut with, with the algorithm commands. Um, in our research, we defined a uh, dust event the, as event that the percent of dust reduced the horizontal visibility to less than 10 kilometers at least to uh, airport and simultaneously. Um, perhaps the most innovative thing about the research has been that we have proposed an adversity index called a uh, dust adversity index. Um, this index includes different uh, variables related with affected, affected area, persistent and intensity of, of the band. Um, by applying the explained methods to our data, we have obtained uh, 483 dust events in the Canary Island in these four, uh, 42 years studied. Um, and we analyze the basic the statistic and I'll calculate the trends to the variables show in the table. And the results uh, were analyzed in different time frames, annual, seasonal, and monthly. And in the table, you can see the gray rows show statistically significant trends. Um, tau uh, evident show the, the sign of the slope. Um, on, in this uh, slide, I show an extract of some of the results of time. Uh, for example, regarding to annual analyze, it is an interesting to know that during this period, both of the number of days with dust event and the duration of this event have decreased. Um, despite these downward trends, annual variability is observed. These results uh, here are in, in, the, in line with the previous study, and these studies examining the annual trends and variability of DAF over North Africa. The author states that the period favorable for DAF production, such as late of 1980s, are caused by anormally high winds and low soil moisture. Um, according to other research, the decreasing trend observed between uh, 1986 uh, to, to 20 was due to a decrease in wind intensity and increase of soil moisture, which contributed to dust suppression. However, since 2011, there has been an increase in dust activity in North of Africa. This can be attributed to a decrease in soil moisture Mr. and increase of wind intensity. Uh, also, bottom left, uh, you can see the dust adversity, adversity index for all event for all dust events recorded in the Canary Island. And bottom right, you can see the evolution, the, season, the seasonal evolution of of die of dust adversity index. Um, it's very important to know that the the um, the event more intense in the Canary Island uh, occur in the first quarter. And the synoptic pattern is characterized by a well-defined di dipole formed by a low cut of low cutoff of the western region of the Canary Island with a high pressure system centered to north-northeast of the Iberian Peninsula. 
to finish, uh, here you are the main conclusion the, of the paper. Um, in black, I, I put the, the remarkable conclusion. Annual analysis reveals that the variables concern the number of day and event duration have exhibited a statistical significant decline. How the, however, there are a variability and we, we can see um, an increased activity since 2011. Uh, the longs does event occur in the month of January and February. Um, obviously, uh, the most the most uh, intense uh, dust event in the Canary Island occurred in February. The seasonal analysis analyze so that the longs and most intense events in terms of the visibility occurred in the first quarter. Uh, only only four events of the total of the 400, 483 uh, event register showed die dust adversity index value greater than 10. And um, yes, the, the first quarter uh, posted the highest average die value. Thank you. Thank you, David. We'll try, we'll be a bit late, but hopefully we'll finish not more than five minutes later. So, next presentation. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. So thank you very much for, for the invitation. I'm going to continue talking about dust events, but in this case, over the Euro-Mediterranean region. So as you uh, know, the last winters have seen an high, a high frequency of dust events over the Western Euro-Mediterranean region. And these events capture the attention of the scientific community, but also the media and the uh, general public, and this was only not only because of the severity and the duration of these events, but also because of the um, the time of the year when they occur, which is unusual. So uh, today I'm going to present some of the results that have recently come out in in this publication in ACP, led by Emilio Cuevas, with the collaboration of um, many co-authors uh, from different institutions, and some of them are, are speakers today. So, the the main objective of this uh, study was first to 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 build a a database uh, of uh, dust events over the Western Euro Mediterranean region in winter, and uh, to explore the the climatology and the long record in order to 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 place the recent period in a long term uh, context i mean to address the exceptionality of the recent um, period and then to explore the uh, synoptic to large scale factors that are associated to these events and this is important because, because this aspect is often overlooked in many studies so to do this, uh, we use different databases going from Ironet stations to satellite products such as MODIS or uh, the reanalysis data from MERA2. And in all cases, we confirm that it was an exceptional, the last winters have uh, seen and uh, have been an exceptional period. Uh, in particular, that period spanning the, 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 the years between 2020 and 2022 uh, had an, um, an aerosol concentration that uh, was record breaking in the in the in the observational period going back to the, to the beginning of the satellite era uh, these high uh, aerosol concentrations uh, were mainly confined to late winter months and particular february and march so all the analysis focused on this uh, late winter months and as for the events we defined the dust events over the Western Euro-Mediterranean region as uh, periods of at least three consecutive days with uh, aerosol concentrations over that region exceeding a given threshold, which is the climatology plus one standard deviation. These events were also classified according to the intensity or the severity of the event. And here in this figure, you can see the sequence, the time series of the events that were detected for February and March separately. And we confirmed that the, uh, we found that there are large uh, 
uh, differences, uh, intraseasonal differences from one winter month to another, and also large interannual variability with uh, active and quiet periods of dust events. In any case, uh, we uh, found that the recent period uh, has been a standing one, not only in terms of frequency of events or days, but also in terms of the duration of the events, some of them exceeded one week, and uh, also in terms of the intensity, because some of the most extreme events have been recorded in the last winters. So then we uh, move to the um, uh, the uh, characterization of the synoptic to large scale uh, drivers of these winter episodes and uh, the analysis uh, for this analysis we use uh, diff different approaches going from uh, uh, cluster analysis, uh, weather regimes, uh, the diagnosis of uh, specific weather systems, including blocking uh, patterns, but also the characterization of the North Atlantic jet stream. Um, the analysis was done separately for the recent anomalous period, but also for the historical record in order to compare them. And I'm uh, uh, here I show an example uh, coming from the analysis of the cluster, the cluster analysis. Here we all uh, winter uh, dust days and we classify them according to the uh, in two clusters the first one is the preferred one the other one are the remaining days and uh, we can see here that the dominant uh, pattern associated with winter dust intrusions over the western Euro Mediterranean is a blocking like structure with high pressures uh, over the northern Europe, uh, low pressures in the mid latitudes. Uh, we also confirm that these low pressure systems are associated to cutoff lows, uh, which were also present in the elder days in the second cluster, meaning that these cutoff lows are a key synoptic driver of winter um, dust events over the Western Mediterranean. However, they can occur under different large scale configurations. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, this dominant pattern is also found in the historical record, but not the second pattern, the second cluster. And that means that the, uh, this uh, recent period was characterized by two different types of, of large scale structures. The first one is the common one, I mean the typical that is often associated with dust events in uh, in 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 that region, but the second type of uh, large scale patterns are uh, were not so common in the historical record. They were in use unusual ones. Okay, so in order to better uncover the uh, characteristics of the synoptic systems that were involved in this second pattern, we perform ad additional analysis, and in particular we. Uh, computed um, or separated dust days that were associated with blocking uh, from those that do not. Okay, so in the uh, first row, you can see the composites of the potential height anomalies for the dust days that are associated with blocks in the two periods, the recent one and the climatological one. And in the bottom, you can see the remaining days. But we can see that uh, in general, the winter dust. Uh, it can occur under different high pressure systems. The most dominant one are blocking associated with high pressure systems at high latitudes. And the second one correspond to high pressure systems over the Mediterranean of the Central Europe, which are often associated with subtropical ridges. So the former, uh, I mean, the blocking is uh, the dominant pattern associated with winter dust events, but the later was particularly frequent in the recent uh, winters. And, and they actually explain um, the high activity, uh, uh, partially explain the high activity of dust events over that region. And I think that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, David. So we. We can now move to the last uh, uh, presentation. I'm sorry for the uh, delay, but uh, we'll, we'll finish a bit later then. So Lucia, please go on. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, in this last presentation, I will uh, briefly talk about the connection between this all this dust product and all this dust research and the social media. This is because uh, uh, a lot has been done and we have seen about uh, a desert dust by scientific community and the advancement brought to something like uh, dusty products. So uh, for records about, about uh, dust occurrences uh, and uh, observation provided uh, precisely for the dust content and so on. And this 
led to the fact that big initiatives like Copernicus are really active in the social media and so reaching a, a lot of people. That is what the scientific community wants to, so that the people is informed about what is the dust, which are the impact of that, uh, how they can use the tools provided by the scientific community and so on. And uh, we also have seen in the last presentation that there are winter cases and these are not so common. So the people, the people wonder about them and that these cases are high in number of occurrences. They are increasing and also the extinction, especially and temporarily, are, going, uh, are increasing in the last uh, years. And all these things uh, raised the interest in the citizen about the dust. And this is something really important. And what's happened is that because of this interest, we have some uh, dissemination tools and dissemination activity from the scientific community. This is just one example is WMO air quality and climate bulletin. So this is not focused on dust, but indeed in 2023, there was one of this bulletin about heat waves and the connection between heat waves and dust that typically occur in the, in the Mediterranean. So coupling two um, others for the health, but together with scientific dissemination activity, then there are also newspapers. So on the newspaper, these are just two examples from Italian newspaper. Uh, there are news about uh, the presence of the of the dust of coming from Sahara on the on the sky of Italy, and the colors of the sky, which is unusual and something like this. Nothing uh, dramatic. Everything is okay, but then you know sometimes newspaper are going to use very uh, attractive titles. And here we have one example. Uh, I put just a translation in, in English below the images is apocalypse over Rome. Apocalypse is something that uh, make the people uh, to be scared about. So uh, people start to think about something strange and this was then reflected in the communication flow. What happened next is that on the Italian television, it, it happened that on a news, uh, news service, it was uh, said uh, wrongly something like, what we have found on our cars is not sand. And uh, the explanation is that of that is that the journalists would like to say sand is not the correct word because these particles are not so large as sand is, are smaller. So we are in the micron dimension and not in millimeter, which are instead the dimension of the sand. But this was interpreted by the people as something like, okay, they are lying to us. They are saying that it is sand, but it is not. Then a lot of this discussion started, but this is just one example on how a correct information can be misleading for the public. This is another example. Some videos on, uh, on social media talking about uh, the magnetic properties of the, of the sand. So the presence of metals and making the people scared about that. And this, this was not a, a wrong information because metals are into the, the, the mineral particle. They are mineral, they, they have metals. But then starting from that correct information, something strange came into, into the social media. So uh, news about dirty cars and the relationship with the chem chemical trails and showing images that only the pilot can see of uh, dirty dust um, back of the, of the airplanes and connecting on this to, to what we call uh, desert dust arriving in the, in the Mediterranean. And of course, this is a fake. Another example of fake news this time is from uh, Spanish people, but uh, uh, wondering about uh, this dirty water falling down after uh, desert dust arrival and saying that since this uh, water was really well mixed with the particles, probably it is not sand because sand is not mixing with, uh, with the water. And so they wonder about and started talking that it's not sand, it's not mineral dust, but it's something else. Other examples, uh, this, this come from uh, Romania uh, in news. 
And they talk about the fact that this uh, red sky, yellow sky is related not to mineral dust, but to action for poisoning the population. So this is something really uh, strange. And uh, also here, more details about the content of this poisoning, uh, uh, artificially poisoning uh, uh, attack to the population, even talking about radioactive cesium, so really uh, fake news and similar. So you see how social media can be dangerous in some way. And then my favorite, uh, fake news about saying that this uh, sky are related to uh, entities that are spraying sand in the sky to convince the people that the global warming is true while it is not. So combining all the complexes um, uh, team in just one sentence. So, but the good news is that it's true that social media can be the place where a lot, a lot of strange theories can go around, but it's also true that there are very good materials and uh, tools for dissemination for the public. I just put two example here on the, on, the, on the left. And also that fact checking is typically working fine and removing the content when it is really dangerous. So the take home message is that the reliability of the sources of information and the reproducibility of the information itself of the data are key aspects. And I would like to say that this kind of event, like the one that we have today, is exactly in this uh, track. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lucia, for for uh, for these nice presentations that reminds us the the challenges that we face as community in dust. So not only about doing good research and advancing the technology and capacity to detect sun and dust storm, but also to communicate uh, well our science. So I let. Uh, I can I say to... something because it's funny. Today I had an interview, and an African journalist asked me about also the activity of Saharan dust. And I think that is because there is an article that connects the nuclear test that it was in Algeria years ago with some kind of remaining radioactivity in the... Yeah. And there is a paper, I, I cannot find it now, but it's funny because today I had to explain that we that is not so much radioactive than yeah. other things, yeah. Okay, we, if there is no additional question or discussion, I would like to thank uh, thanks all the contributors and the participators, the, the people that participate to the webinar, and we can close it here. And uh, thank you again. And now before to close, because I can see Daniel. Daniel is here. <laughs> Daniel. Hey, everyone. Daniel yeah. Tong, the chair of the Global Steering Committee of the SDS Woods at the end is here. <laughs> Daniel, if you you can say goodbye because we are late, and you can jump to the Pan American webinar. Yeah, I was tuning in and I was listening to all the interesting talks. Thank you all very much uh, for putting this together. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, your yeah, all of this uh, support is great. Um, I really enjoyed it, um, and thank you very much. And happy that's the day. So Sarah said. Thank you, Daniel. Now you can close the webinar. So, bye, bye, everybody. Thank Take you. Take care. Have a Thank good day. Bye, bye, bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.